All right, good. Okay, so um, are you guys actually ready to use Firebase? We're actually going to use it real quick, if you guys wouldn't mind. Uh, some friends of mine are, uh, have a project, and they would really love your help testing it out. It's at this URL here. If you could just go there, I'm going to go ahead and start this meeting. It's going to allow you to give me live feedback through the meeting. So if you give me a thumbs up, it'll go here. Uh, you can do uh, meh. I don't like it, but please don't do that, because that's going to hurt my feelings. OK, all right. Let me move over to PowerPoint. I've also got the, uh, the link here, just in case you forget what it is. All right, let's do this. This is uh, Directives at Scale, and it's really a better alternate title might be what we learned building integrations for Angular uh, on top of Kindo UI. Now, this presentation has a lot of Kindo UI in it. I work for Telerik, which makes Kindo UI, but it's really about directives, so um, Kindo UI is not really the point of the presentation. It's sort of what we learned and how we tried to scale our directives. Um, let me turn this on. I swear I know how to use technology. All right, so that's the URL. Yeah, I started the meeting, we're good to go. Okay, so let's talk about Angular Kindo UI for just a minute. Um, like any open source project, there's more than just me. These people actually uh, do more of the work than I do. This is uh, Pierre, Amkar, and Mihai, who works on the team. And as far as I know, he's an optical illusion. I've never actually seen him. All right, so when we first launched Kindo UI in 2011, at the very end, we wanted to provide integrations for people because we realized that having great UI controls is great, but you also have to have a framework to put them in. And at the time, we wanted to provide integration with Backbone because we saw Backbone as the library that everybody was using. So we actually created demos and put them on our site. Now, if I can take you through sort of a timeline of what 2012 looked like after the initial launch, it kind of looked like this. We would get user voice requests, forum posts, support tickets, and they would be about Backbone. And then Knockout started to show up. And then it was all Knockout for the rest of the year. Now, Right at about the same time, well, say in the March time frame, we actually added declarative initialization to Kendo UI. And we did that because the engineering teams on the other teams that were building other products were using Kendo UI and they asked for it because we use our own products. So it's not good enough for us. It's definitely not good enough for you. Uh, and then right about here, we added our own MVVM framework. Now, we didn't use Knockout, and the reason why we didn't use Knockout is not because it's not great, it's amazing. It's because when you take a dependency on a third-party framework, you're tightly coupling yourself to something else, and it sort of affects your ability to be agile, and Kindo UI has a very aggressive release cycle. Now, let's, uh, oh, we also created Knockout integrations at the same time as well. I should point that out um, for, the, for the Knockout people. And now let's fast forward to 2013, and this is what it starts to look like. And it got really weird. We were like, holy crap, what the heck? Um, and what's interesting about this slide is it matches up with the um, slide that Mishko showed the other day um, on the analytics. So if you take a look at it, right here we released our own SPA framework so that we could offer people an end-to-end -end solution. Um, and right here is where Angular starts to get really popular, which is around like early summertime. And so here, our product manager, Brandon Satram, hits me up over email and he's like, bro, would you mind having a look at Angular and seeing what it's like to create some integrations for Angular on top of Kindo UI? We think that would be something really neat to add. And I said, sure. So I took a look uh, and we created the Angular Kindo UI project. And the first step was this, which I think is everybody's first step when they're working with Angular, uh, and, but thanks to John Lindquist, I sort of made it through this and learned how to write directives. And in the process, I wrote an article for Adobe called um, Angular JS Directives and the Computer Science of JavaScript. And it was sort of kind of trying to unravel that and wrap my head around what direct directives actually were. Now, like any other good software developer, I don't have any other, any really original ideas. And so I was like, well, what's everybody else doing? So this is the, actually from the Angular UI. This is the bootstrap integrations. And so you notice they have one directive for every component. Uh, and now, I'm not saying that Angular UI is bad. It's awesome. You should all use it. Um, I'm just kind of trying to take you through my thought process. And so I looked at that, and I was like, well, what do we have in Kindo UI? I was like, well, we got autocompletes, numeric text boxes, uh, grids. We got data visualization. Well, let's get the mobile framework. I was like, well, well, let's punt the mobile framework and just talk about web and data viz. And I started looking at all the widgets, and I knew what the roadmap was, so I knew what was coming, too. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I have to write one directive for all of these widgets, like we're going to need an entire other product team to write these directives for all these widgets. I was like, we can't, 
this, not, this doesn't work for me. I can't do this. Like, I have other stuff to do, and I'm just one dude, uh, and I'm really not that good of a coder anyway. So what I did was I went back, and I, I tried to get smart about it. And I was like, well, Kindle UI has declarative initialization. And it works kind of like this. You give something a role. This is an autocomplete. And then you set your values. And this is similar to Angular, right? It's declarative initialization. And then a source, which could be an array or a Kindle UI data source, which was, has remote capabilities. And then what you do is you have a view model. Now, I've called it scope because I'm at an Angular conference, and I feel like that's the right word to use. Uh, but then you bind it, and everything works. Your widgets are bound. You can bind HTML this way. This is how Kindle UI works. And you get this, which is clearly an autocomplete. Now, what I did was this. I was like, all right, what if I just create one directive, and then I'll just bind the elements, and I'll just use the scope as the view model. Now, this is an oversimplification. I try to do other stuff, too. But I did this, and I ran it and I, with the same exact HTML, except for I just added in a Kindo attribute. And I got the same autocomplete. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Ship it. I'm like, I'm the smartest person that has ever lived. I just wrote an entire set of integrations in like eight lines. Um, and then the community was like, uh, so we noticed that when we change the value of the autocomplete, it, the scope doesn't change. And I'm like, is that supposed to happen? <laughs> they're like, well, yeah, dude. And they're like, and vice versa. When we change the scope, the widget doesn't change. I'm like, all right, let's go back and look at this again. But I'm still going back to all these directives, and I just can't, I just can't swallow this. This is, this is not feasible for me. Um, and so I had this idea, like, what if our directives could build themselves, right? Um, and that sounds kind of ridiculous, but let me kind of show you what I mean. And what we're going to do is go through th sort of three different things that we did to kind of make this happen. So let's think this through. All of the Kindle UI widgets share a common API. They inherit from the same base widgets, like a list widget or a, a pop-up widget. So they all have change uh, events, and they all have value methods. Um, we're primarily concerned with those value methods and those change events so that we can update the scope and vice versa. Uh, the user, by the way, has already told us which directives they want to use. We don't even have to ask. They don't need to include the directives because they've already told us which ones they intend to use. If you think about it, just like jQuery UI, Kindle UI puts all of its widgets off of a UI namespace. So if you go to that namespace, any of the widgets that the user has included in their bundle are already there. Now, whether or not they use them, if they include the kitchen sink and they only use an autocomplete, well, as far as we know, you've intended to use them all, but you only ended up using one. Hopefully people don't do that, but I do it all the time, so I'm guilty myself. So we thought, what if uh, we don't build directives? Now, here's what I mean by that. Instead of building a bunch of directives, what if we just build one directive and then use that directive to build a bunch of other directives? I know, this is kind of like the yo dog scenario, but we're going to get through this. So the first thing that we did was we iterated over the Kindle UI namespace. And what that got us was a list of all the widgets. Now, here's the code. It's not that interesting, except to notice that we're just iterating over the namespace. Uh, and then for each namespace, all we're doing is applying some quick regex and then pushing this Kindo value in the front so we can do imperative initialization on our widgets. You guys know imperative initialization, old school, select this thing with the dollar sign, call some method on it, which turns it into a widget. Uh, and then what we did was we took all of the attributes and we made them K attributes and we merged those all together. Now, this is an oversimplification again, but I'm just trying to give you a high level of what we did. Uh, and then we did binding on the change event and the value methods, because all of the widgets share these methods. Um, and then the last thing that we do is we initialize the widget. So what we've done is for each widget that's in that namespace, we've gone through and we've actually had the directive spin up itself. So at this point, we actually now have, if you've included all 56 widgets, you have 56 directives, even though we only created one directive. Now, <laughs> this brings us to this. Is that even a good idea? Um, the answer to that question is, I'm not really sure yet. We're still kind of working through towards a V1. But let's look at some of the benefits of what that gets you. Uh, it's really, really dry, obviously, because you're not repeating yourself over and over again writing the same code. Uh, it doesn't require any bundling 
on the user's part and doesn't require us to provide a bundling interface for the user. So Kindle UI right now has a, a bundling feature you can go in and you say, I need this, these widgets and it detects dependencies and it gives you a bundle. Well this way, we can give them one, uh, in, one file and it, depending on what they've already bundled, it sort of just kind of scales along with that bundle automatically. And also no boilerplate. Boilerplate's bad for some reason. Even though you can create snippets in pretty much any IDE to handle this for you, uh, boilerplate's bad. I'm pretty sure that's right. All right. What about, uh, and it scales automatically with Kindle UI, obviously, right? So Kindle UI adds a new widget. It has value and change methods. And we don't do anything to the code in theory. And it all just works, just works. What's the catch? Because that sounds really too good to be true. Well, first of all, it's monolithic. Super duper brittle. Uh, if you break one widget, you have broken them all. Congratulations. Uh, the other problem with it is that complex widgets demand special attention. So they're not all auto-completes and drop-down lists and numeric text boxes. That's actually quite simple. Uh, there's things, grids, there are schedulers. The scheduler is essentially the entire calendar component of Outlook in a web page. Uh, you can't just bind to the change in value methods on that and call it a day. Uh, and so what we do to handle that is we sort of spackle over that by providing additional directives for the more complex widgets. The other question is, does it really scale? And what I mean by that is, will we find ourselves in a spot where it, we've got so many widgets and they're so complex and it's grown so large that we really do need to break it down into individual directives for each one? And again, as Tim Berners-Lee said, many years ago, a really good idea sort of takes shape over time, and you kind of have to go into it and build it and find out that you did it wrong so that you can find out how to do it right. The second thing that we did was we begin to teach our directives with metadata. Now, what I mean by that is in the head of every Kindle UI file, you have something that looks like this. All right, so you have a module, and then you have inside the module, then, and this, a lot of this, some of this is for require.js, some of it's for our internal tooling, because we build a lot of tooling on top of it. But if you've noticed, down here there's things like what it depends on, so it needs these two modules to function. And we use that internally so that we have enough information. Now, what we are thinking about doing is adding to this to support Angular. Now right now this is just a proof of concept, but the idea is that we would add in to this, uh, to this metadata, something like this, okay? In the, ch in, the, in the case of the numeric text box, it really changes twice. Uh, it changes if you go and you type in it, that's a change, but it also changes if you hit the spinner on the left and right side, on the left side, right side, left side, right, yeah, right side. Golly, geez. You go <laughs> up or down, I'm in. It's day two, I'm fried. Um, and so we want to be able to provide this information to the directive so that it knows you not only need to bind to the change event, but you need to bind to the spin event too because the scope's going to need to be updated on both of those. The third thing we used was, uh, we learned was use Angular responsibly. Um, and I hope you'll allow me some latitude here to sort of share an opinion that I have on this after going through and, and writing a lot of Angular directive code. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it's not necessary for you to go full Angular uh, all the time just because you're using Angular. Some of you will get this joke. <laughs> Many of you probably won't, that's okay. Uh, now, what I mean by that is I don't mean that you shouldn't use Angular. I mean that it's not necessary to use all of the utilities that Angular provides just because you're using Angular. Um, and when I first started doing this, that's exactly what I did. Uh, I said, okay, I'm using Angular, so I'm gonna use all the Angular utils, there's like services and factories, and I'm gonna use those, and I essentially just abused the crap out of Angular. Uh, and the truth is, there are constructs in JavaScript, <laughs> things like objects, functions, those things are perfectly fine. Uh, they work great, and you can still use them. Uh, but I, when I first started writing Angular, I sort of uh, tried to use everything as if it were a replacement for JavaScript. So I would do things like this. We were talking about that iteration logic. In this case, I'm actually using a service and a provider to iterate over the namespaces and then provide that value back out via a service which I then inject into my directive. Now, it works. And it's testable, and that's awesome. 
But why? Uh, it turns out, I learned this, this actually works too. Um, you may recognize this. This is uh, just a function in an object. And it turns out, I, I swear, you can execute this and then you can actually test to see if there's objects in this and you don't have to use a service to do that. Now, that, what, what that is is that's my ignorance using things in the wrong way. But I think that we sort of take things and we kind of want to do them the right way uh, and we uh, take things, the, we take the whole framework and we start to use the whole thing and we want to use all the constructs because we want, to, uh, we want to do it right. But we can still use plain JavaScript and use it responsibly. So let's recap. The first thing that we learned was don't build directives. Uh, and that means, of course, that we want to build as few directives as possible because the more directives you have, the more code that you have to maintain. The second thing we're going to do is leverage metadata. So if you can pass metadata from the files that you're wrapping your directives around, then you can pass a lot of the information that you need into your directives. And then the third one, of course, is just to use Angular responsibly. Just because the constructs are there doesn't mean that, they're that you're using them correctly. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I made it a little bit early. And I'm going to check on your, let's see here. What? Did it really? Oh my gosh. That's me. I did it. I brought it to its knees. That was you guys. That's credit goes to you. All right, well, at least we tried. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.